1993 Toyota Camry wagon. An ugly dad car, which was dismissed for 28 years as a ride for out-of-touch, stylishly lame dweebs and losers, now resurfaces in 2021 as a hip whip for those riding the shining edge of car culture's broadsword, stabbing the cultural horizon of what's cool. So Is it a Camry for? Is it a Camry for? This is a seven passenger beige on beige station wagon with a big mom ass caressed by two rear windshield wipers. It is designated the XV10 and powered by an optional 3VZ FE V6 making 185 horsepower. Most Camrys have vending machine four bangers, which run great, but are weak in loaded wagon applications. So the 3VZ FE was offered as a stopgap until Toyota could finish the all aluminum 1MZ FE. The 3VZ FE is really a truck engine. Toyota took their single cam 3VZ-E engine from the 4Runner, Toyota Pickup, and T100, changed the heads, added variable intake runners, then they, tur then they turned the longitudinal engine transversely, tilted it back 15 degrees, shoved it into a station wagon, and said, there, it's a car engine now. So 185 horsepower at 5,800 RPM, and 189 pound-feet of torque at 4,600 RPM and a compression of 9.6 to 1. And Toyota, in the name of the Jarl, made this feel normal. Since the torque and horsepower numbers are almost identical, and they peak only 1,200 RPM apart, the power feels like a, like a gentle logarithmic curve. Driving this it makes it feel like it's the ideal car for a late 1990s educator. Plenty of room for all your books and supplies that you have to pay for out of your own pocket for a group of students who rather just watch something on the roll-on TV while carving veins into an already carved dick carving on a desk the district can't afford to replace. My farts sound like a Wesley Willis song. And as for that beautiful badonk, it's wild to think this body style could have been even wider if not for automotive tax laws in Japan, which necessitated a narrower design, which wouldn't sell in the United States. So here comes the XV10 design for 1991 to satisfy the demand for chonk. Average fuel economy is around 20 to 24 miles per gallon combined, rated around 18 city, 24 highway for the V6 in here. The transmission is a four-speed automatic with overdrive, and it's about as constant as you could ask for. This wagon is the daily you can count on, like road alerts on an AM radio. In fact, that's what's great about it. It's a car that refuses to disappoint you because it doesn't care enough about being impressive enough in the first place. The camera wagon doesn't put on any airs at all. It is not trying. It's a reliable wagon that saves money through that reliability, and you pocket the difference to use however you see fit. You want to keep giving money to Star Citizen? Keep giving money to Star Citizen? Ugh, the game's not going to finish itself, right? Maybe we should call this the Toyota mattress because 28 years on, y'all are still sleeping on this car. 1993 Toyota Corolla wagon for the man whose favorite strong bad email is long pants. In the same way that IPAs taste like angry produce, the Toyota Corolla wagon drives like a teenager who's been given freedom before he's ready for it. And in that regard, it's probably perfect as a first car because it's unsettlingly quiet, which smothers the worst instincts of Rodney Blowoff Valve Simmons, the teenager who's morally compromised by his own jawline. As great as it can be, if you're in the market for a first car, it's probably even better if you're in the market for a reliable last car. For that age when you still have your license, but you know the doomsday clock is getting closer to midnight. We normally don't talk about the owner directly in RCR, even in passing, but Ian here is a pretty interesting guy. He's 21 years old, 
and he's already on his 22nd car. How did he do that? He's owned two uh, SW20 MR2s, a 100 series Toyota Land Cruiser, Fiesta ST, Pontiac G8 GT, two Yaris hatchbacks, an LS400, 2020 Corolla hatchback, a Toyota Sequoia, and a Honda S2000. Currently, he's just had this and an MR2 Spider. And it's fascinating because it speaks to a larger element of car culture that tends to rub people the wrong way, the infidelity of it all. When I bought a Toyota MR2, uh, my Mark 1B AW11, that was my dream car. I had wanted that forever. Memories of that car were burned in since elementary school. But it ended up, well, not quite being a case of never meet your heroes. I mean, it kind of is. Not because the car wasn't great, but because I realized that the MR2 being my dream car didn't automatically make me the right owner for it. It'd be like winning a Maserati on a game show when you live in an apartment and would have to street park it. You know, when I had that MR2, all I did was worry about it every place I parked it because really the car's only theme was being new because it was like perfect. I came to realize that while my MR2 was in my possession, all it would do was sit in storage and it deserved better than that. And frankly, so did I. I felt selling it was the right thing to do because automotive enthusiasm isn't about monogamy. And it makes me happy that the new owner of my MR2 lives in Malibu, California, and my little Pennsylvania MR2 gets to live out the rest of its life away from the snow and the salt and all of that, and it gets to retire in California where it'll be safe, and that makes me feel happy. Ian flips cars and gets bored of others and gets interested in new projects, which leads a quick turnaround in ownership. And that's okay. Geez, if you have the ability to live that life, then you don't really owe anybody an explanation. You don't have to justify keeping or getting rid of something. And yes, you'll have people who will call you out for not staying loyal, for not eternally being the person who stays with the thing he said he would stick with, because sometimes a divorce is no one's fault. And the decision to sell the car you dreamed of having, sometimes that isn't anybody's fault either. It's just reality. And the idea that we can't change our minds once we attain our summit car is an opinion that belongs in the hot take graveyard, right next to Gran Turismo is overrated. Speaking of racing games, it ties back to the year that this wagon came out. Because 1993 was also the birth of... And it was every bit the experience that a Camry wagon would turn out to be. Daytona USA was always a dependable good time. And in a sense, 1993 was the year of dependable goodness. You had Jurassic Park, Wayne's World, Mortal Kombat 2, Enter the Wu-Tang, In Utero, August and Everything After, NBA Jam, Doom, and this Toyota Camry Wagon. Roll down the windows and blast 36 chambers, and you tell me if there's ever been a car you could blast Wu-Tang out of where it didn't sound correct. It was an age of sleepovers with your middle school friends huddled around the center of the living room watching movies which were as hit or miss as elementary school pizza. But none of that matters because it's 1993 and Wu-Tang is for the people. Oh, the butt. This car, it, it's, it's like Reducto from Harvey Birdman said, that booty too fine. Yeah, it's just a Camry sedan with a wagon ass on the back with no thought of style or proportion. Motor Week back in 1992 called this a hearse or an old shoe, and they even called it controversial. And, and prices for this wagon... They were a bit high, uh, uh, $21,000 in 1993 or about $37,600 in 2021, which approaches Lexus territory. But then, apart from the LS400, the Lexus name wasn't well established in the United States yet. Ian uh, swapped on some LS400 wheels here. I, mean, I didn't even know the bolt pattern was the same and the offset was the same, so hey, it works. So let's talk about the Pontiac Aztec. A car that tried so hard to be cool and revolutionary that it was laughed at harder than me trying to reinvent myself freshman year in high school. 
I mean, that act lasted two days because what's freshman year in high school? It's just everybody from eighth grade and everybody knows who you are. It's just the building is different. The Aztec committed the cardinal sin of try hardness, which is disingenuousness. Underneath all this angular body panels was the same old weak-willed General Motors crap. But Toyota didn't try hard with the Camry wagon. They made a righteous effort to build the most comfortable, reliable, and practical station wagon they could and let the style fall where it may. All the doors and hatches close perfectly. All the buttons are crisp and new. Even the rear hatch handle and third row seats are made of the same specs as the front. And it's in this enduring build quality that our memories stay preserved. I, I realize that a, a good portion of you were born after the 90s. RCR has been around for seven years now. And some of you watching this were born in the year 2000. Maybe you're not driving yet. So what I'm describing to you, you, you weren't alive then in the 90s. But you can have this car and drive it or ride in it, and you will be able to feel a nostalgia for a time in which you never existed. I'm going to end this review, and I realize this is getting a little bit long, but uh, I'm going to end it with a story about marching band and why this car resonates so deeply with me. When I was, uh, uh, okay, here's how marching band worked. Um, do I have any notes on this? No. No, I'll just freestyle it. School let out at 2.58. You couldn't, uh, if you drove to school, you couldn't leave until like 3.15 because uh, you had to wait for all the buses to leave first. And then if you drove to school then, or if, you, or if you're getting a ride with somebody else, um, you had to wait for all the buses to leave. And then at 3.15, once the last bus left, then you could leave with your cars. You had a window from 3.15 to 5.30 on a Friday. At 5.30, you had to be back in the band room uh, to get into your uniform because you did run through. We would do run throughs of the show from uh, 6 to 6.30. And then at 6.30, uh, we had to line up and march. We would march to the cadence. We would march all the way down to the football stadium and uh, uh, set up. You know, some of our stuff, you had to get equipment and, and the marimbas and everything now, the big concert bass drum, uh, timpanis, we had to get them on the truck, get them all the way down. Don't worry, this is about cars. And all the way down uh, to the football stadium and then line up again uh, for the pregame show, uh, which was at 7 because kickoff was like 7.15. So we had all this stuff to do. So you had this window from 7, from 3.15 to 5.30, although it's really five. So three to four, four to five. So you had just under two hours of downtime. And that was the time for the ultimate amount of socialization when you're a freshman in high school, because you're at the school, you're not going home, school's not in session, and some of your friends have cars. So we're going to Burger King, because at that time, McDonald's was like lower tier to us and Burger King was, we, we had to get food. We had to eat some sort of dinner because the opportunity to get food didn't come until halftime. And then there was an insane line for the concession stand at the football stadium. Shout out to Ben, Ben Zavarkas and Chris, Chris Eckroth because they had cars and they were seniors. So we really looked up to them. Oh, I miss Ben and I'll never forget it. We all piled into, and this really isn't about a Camry wagon. It's about, a, I think uh, Ben had a Ford Taurus. But this moment, I'm telling you, I'm getting into a car without an adult. It's other students, and we're driving to Burger King unsupervised. Hell yes. This is the greatest day of my life. I am free in a way I never have been. And it was all car, because this was 1996. So it was all like older cars. Some were from the 80s. Some people had stuff from the 90s. And there were a few... Camry wagons that people had 
from, you know, their parents. Because this was just like the old family wagon. But for us, it was a rocket ship to freedom. And this third row seat, there was nothing more irresponsible than a station wagon full of teenagers. And we got, oh, it has a CD, a CD player, a tape deck. You'd crank the music until it distorted and rock all the way to frickin' Burger King. And it's like 17, you get like two of these cars, seven people and 14 teenagers taking over the Burger King. And we're all band nerds. So we're just, I mean, this is way before memes. We were probably saying Wayne's World stuff. And then all the way back, flooring it. So that's why this car is great. It's, it's, it's the joyous... Uh, it's the joyous, like, uh, explosion, like firework explosion that you are free of any sort of uh, tracking or anything. I mean, it was way before phones. We were out away and no one could find us. And then control came back and back you're in marching band and everything going back. Man. So, yeah. If you weren't around for that age, I guarantee you, if you find a Camry wagon... Th those memories are in these seats. That type of passion for small trips exists in this car. Well, anyway, thanks for coming with me on this memory trip. 1993 Toyota Camry wagon, fantastic. And here is a channel you waited for. Podcasts and essays, just click like and subscribe. Bum, bum, ba -dum. Just head on over to RCR2. Call regular enrollment and it's too new to describe. Bum, bum, ba RCR2. RCR2.